that outflamed. The trees changed to fire with a roar. On the eve of the 20th century, H.G. Wells imagined a war of the worlds in which alien invaders left the capital city of the world's greatest empire in ruins. Most people think of his book as science fiction. In fact, it was a work of astonishing prescience. For the scenes of havoc Wells depicted were to recur time and again throughout the hundred years that followed. It was a century in which lethal new weapons were deployed to devastating effect. I saw, approaching over the young pine trees, monstrous beings of glittering metal. They wiped us out. Simply wiped us out. It was a century in which countless families were driven from their homes. It was a century in which city after city was laid waste, not just in the world wars, but year after year, in what seemed like a global hundred years war. The difference with Wells's nightmare vision was simply that those responsible were not Martians. They were human beings who, in order to justify the killings, defined other humans as aliens. The question is, why? What made the 20th century, despite all its scientific and material progress, the most violent in history? What made men act like Martians? As a schoolboy, people tried to explain the violence of the 20th century to me in terms of class conflict or extreme ideologies like nationalism and socialism or great power rivalry. But this nasty story had a happy ending because the good guys, that was the Western democracies, won both the World Wars and the Cold War. Well, in this series, I want to tell you that that was all wrong. It wasn't class, but race that was the dominant idea of the 20th century. And it was your race that decided how you and your family fared in this Hundred Years' War. It wasn't nation-states or great powers that were the principal players on the stage, but empires. As they declined, they clashed, and out of their ruins arose new and more terrible empires. By the time they'd been vanquished, not much was left of that dominance the West had enjoyed at the beginning of the century. For the principal theme of the 20th century wasn't the triumph of the West at all. It was the resurgence of the East. In 1900, the West really did rule the world from the Balkans, through the Caucasus, across the Indian subcontinent, Indochina and China itself. Nearly all of what was then known as the Orient was under some form or another of European imperial rule. The East had been subjugated. Perhaps nothing symbolized Western power over Asia more strikingly than the vast Trans-Siberian Railway which links Moscow to Vladivostok, 6,000 miles to the east. 
rested on machinery and migration. All over Europe, people were on the move, leaving for America, for Australia, for Africa. Russians, too, were moving eastwards, integrating the more numerous peoples of Central and East Asia into the Western Imperial Project. But when Russians migrated, they took the train. The building of the Trans-Siberian Railway was the culmination of one of the most explosive imperial expansions of the entire 19th century. More than two million Russians headed east, creating a vast Asian empire that reached through Manchuria as far as the Korean frontier. Yet this mass movement carried the seeds of the great imperial struggle between West and East that would define the 20th century. To many contemporaries, it was a racial war that was brewing. As they headed eastwards, Europeans were at once repelled and attracted by what they encountered. The Asiatic peoples looked and sounded very different. And their standard of living was generally lower. A whole new theory of race seemed to explain this. Western man was biologically a superior being. In looking down on the Asians in their empire, the Russians were entirely typical. What they and other complacent Europeans tended to forget was that their strengths, in particular their technological superiority, were not a monopoly conferred by providence on people with white skins. In the second week of February 1904, reports reached St. Petersburg of a surprise torpedo attack on Russian ships in the furthest flung outpost of the Tsar's vast Asian empire, Port Arthur in Manchuria. The attack outraged Russians, not least because it was carried out by an Asian country, Japan. The government in St. Petersburg decided on massive retaliation. Rather splendid models are of the pride of the Imperial Russian Navy, the second fleet stationed in the Baltic Sea. The decision was taken to send the full-scale versions to punish the Japanese for their act of Asian effrontery. Here in St. Petersburg, people looked forward with sublime confidence to victory and to vengeance. <laughs> In the press, the Japanese were portrayed as puny, jaundiced monkeys fleeing in panic before the giant white fist of Mother Russia, or as oriental midgets about to be gobbled up by a giant Cossack. Not for the last time in the 20th century, notions of innate racial superiority were to prove deceptive. More than six months later, after pit stops in the North Sea in Madagascar, the Russian fleet finally got a crack at the dreaded Yellow Peril. It was an awful long way to go for a thrashing. May the 27th, 1905, at the Battle of Tsushima, the Japanese sent two-thirds of the Russian fleet to the bottom of the sea. We're sometimes tempted to think of the 20th century in terms of the triumph of the West, and yet the Russo-Japanese War demonstrated that the tide was turning as early as 1904. As the superior performance of the Japanese military clearly illustrated, there really was no inherent advantage to being a European. <laughs> 
Yet the assumptions about Western racial superiority that had so misled Russia's leaders were not about to disappear. On the contrary, the crisis unleashed by the war within Russia would soon reveal their enduring potency. Before 1900, men had tended to believe that it was power and property that were inheritable. After 1900, however, powerful new political doctrines, democracy and socialism, seemed to overwhelm the hereditary principle. In 1905, democracy and socialism came together in St. Petersburg to challenge the inherited power of the Romanov dynasty. That January, as military disaster was unfolding in the Far East, dissatisfaction erupted into revolution in the Russian capital after troops fired on a peaceful demonstration by workers and their families. of strikes and riots that swept the country shook the Tsarist regime to its foundations. Among the leaders of a new revolutionary council known as the Soviet was a flamboyant journalist who went by the name of Leon Trotsky. Socialists like Trotsky aimed at replacing a system based on inherited thrones and wealth with one that aimed at equality. Yet whatever its appeal to the workers in the huge factories of St. Petersburg, Trotsky's far-brand rhetoric left the majority of the Tsar's subjects cold. Hereditary privilege was one thing, but if you were born Leib Bronstein, as Trotsky was, you couldn't get rid of your hereditary identity as a Jew. The fact of Trotsky's Jewishness made him inherently suspect. Jews were emphatically second-class citizens in Cyrus, Russia, subject to regulations restricting their access to education and the professions and confining them to the so-called pale of Jewish settlement. The 1905 revolution saw a fresh wave of anti-Jewish violence. <laughs> Russian socialists might talk the language of class, but other Russians retorted by invoking the hereditary principle of race. By the end of December 1905, the Tsarist regime had reasserted its control, and Trotsky was languishing in jail. The Russian Empire had suffered humiliation in the East and at home, but that did not diminish its thirst for expansion. Undaunted by the danger of another humiliating defeat or renewed revolution, the Tsar embarked on a massive program of rearmament and railway construction. Only this time, the railways Russia built ran not eastwards to Asia, they ran westwards towards Germany and Austria-Hungary and their primary function was to carry not goods, but troops. The European empires would travel to their own destruction by train. <laughs> 
of the First World War is usually dated from the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand on June the 28th, 1914, by a Bosnian Serb named Gavrilo Princip. Princip's shots really did echo all around the world. The reverberations caused the overthrow of four great empires, unleashed unprecedented ethnic conflict, and greatly hastened the decline of the West. The interesting thing from a modern point of view is that Princip's crime started out as an act of state-sponsored terrorism. The mastermind behind the operation was like a villain from one of the Tintin stories, Colonel Dragutin Dmitrievich. It was his secret organization, the Black Hand, that trained a group of Bosnian teenagers for what was intended to be a suicide mission to murder the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne when he visited Sarajevo. The assassins were sent across the border with four Browning revolvers, six bombs and cyanide tablets. The difficult thing to work out is how an act of terrorism in an obscure corner of Ruritania could have such massive consequences. On June the 28th, Princip and his fellow suicide bombers took up their positions on the procession route. What followed was a black comedy of errors. One of Princip's comrades had thrown a grenade at the Archduke, but it had bounced off his car, injuring people in the crowd. The would-be assassin was arrested. Any sensible politician would have made a speedy exit at this point, but Franz Ferdinand decided he should visit the wounded in hospital. Inherited privilege has its obligations. When the nervous chauffeur took a wrong turning, Princip suddenly found himself face to face with his intended targets. I was filled with a peculiar feeling and I aimed at the air apparent from the pavement. I believe I fired twice, perhaps more, because I was so excited. Princip had managed to wound the Archduke fatally with a shot through the neck, but his second bullet hit the Archduke's wife by accident. To cap it all, the cyanide pills failed to work. At his trial, Princip was asked what he'd been trying to achieve. To do away with those who obstruct and do evil, who stand in the way of unification. I never thought that after the assassination there would be a war. But how exactly could the gunshots that landed Gavrilo Princip in this Sarajevo courtroom have sparked off the first of the century's two world wars, a conflict that raged all over the globe and claimed nearly 10 million lives? After all, assassinations were ten a penny in the early 1900s. Terrorism was all the rage amongst extreme nationalists. Why did this one criminal act have such vast, world-shaking consequences? The answer is that when the Archduke was shot, he was driving over one of the world's great fault lines, the fateful historic border between the West and the East, the Occident and the Orient. The trouble with geological fault lines is that as the Earth's tectonic plates grind uneasily against one another, they're where earthquakes happen. Here in Sarajevo, it was the geopolitical tectonic plates known as empires that were shifting. Turkey's was giving way. Austria's was pushing forward. And so too was Russia's. Once Bosnia had been a part of the Ottoman Empire. Many Bosnians had converted to Islam. But in 1908, Austria had annexed Bosnia. When a Serb murdered their Archduke, the Austrians, reasonably enough, demanded redress from Serbia. And the Russians felt they could not afford to see Serbia humiliated. All the ingredients were thus in place for an imperial war between Austria and Russia 
over the balance of power in the Balkans. But why and how did the other empires get involved? Historians used to explain the outbreak of the First World War as the result of an elaborate game of diplomatic chess, with the Germans lining up on the Austrian side of the board and the French taking the Russian side. The argument went that the Germans had to take the offensive, fearing a future Russian checkmate, but the Russians could rely on the French to make a blocking move. Yet in many ways the Germans were merely reacting to the shifting of the Austrian and Russian tectonic plates in the Balkans, and in particular, to the increasingly reckless imperial policies of Russia's rulers. Even so, it needed one more empire to become involved for this to become not just a European war, but a world war. And that empire was the biggest one of them all. In London, no one gave a damn about Serbia. Yet when British cabinet ministers met on August the 2nd, the decision whether to remain neutral or to go to war against the dauntingly well-trained and well-equipped Germans was an agonizing one. As so often during the 20th century, British politicians rather struggled to work out what the issue was. Some worried that the Germans might violate Belgian neutrality, others that their own rather precarious government might fall. But what was really at stake was whether this would be a continental war, one that the Germans would most probably win, or a world war, the outcome of which no one could foresee. After much deliberation, the cabinet plumped for the world war over German domination of the continent. What nobody could foresee was just how long this world war would last. Although we tend to think of the First World War as a four-year affair, in reality the global earthquake now being unleashed would shake the world for closer to four decades. As the British Foreign Secretary famously observed, the lights were going out all over Europe and might not be lit again in his lifetime. But even as the lights of Westminster grew dim, world war was igniting the fires of racial hatred. The war of 1914 to 1918 was a world war in the sense that the world came to Europe to fight. In 1914, Britain's army in India was bigger than its army in Britain. Turbaned warriors from the Raj were soon joined by volunteers from all over the British Empire. From New Zealand, from Canada, from Australia, from South Africa. The French, too, deployed Senegalese and Indochinese colonial troops. Indeed, nearly all the armies that fought in the war were multi-ethnic, like the empires they represented. Ironically, men could have more in common with their enemies than with those fighting alongside them. The German and British soldiers who faced one another along the Western Front were drawn from remarkably similar societies. In both armies, there were Catholics, Protestants, and Jews. In both armies, there were working-class soldiers and aristocratic senior officers. Their uniforms were different colors, but not their skins. And yet, despite these similarities, Anglo-Saxons and Saxon-Saxons came to regard one another as deeply divided ancestral foes. Nothing illustrates better the way the war bred racial hatred than the change in attitudes that occurred towards enemy prisoners. Conventions governing the treatment of prisoners had been codified only a decade before. Now they were willfully ignored. When Colonel Frank Maxwell, VC, left his battalion after the Battle of the Somme, he praised his men for having... ...begun to learn that the only way to treat the German is to kill him. 
I hardly know what a prisoner looks like, and one of the reasons for this is that this battalion knows how to look after its thirsty souls. In the words of Private Stephen Graham, the opinion cultivated in the army regarding the Germans was that they were a sort of vermin-like plague, rats that had to be exterminated. The Germans had become not just enemies, but aliens. The fact that such attitudes could take root on the Western Front was quite amazing. After all, the ethnic differences in those two sides were minimal. It was an indication of how easily hatred, the urge to annihilate, could take root in the brutalising conditions of total war. In other theatres of war, where ethnic differences were deeper, the potential for unconstrained violence was greater still. Although the heaviest fighting took place on the Western Front, the First World War changed remarkably little in Western Europe. The balance of power remained the same. By contrast, the war on the Eastern Front seemed to change almost everything beyond the River Elbe. In October 1917, the Bolshevik party, led by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, staged a coup d'etat in Petrograd. It was actually a rather minor event. More people were hurt in this subsequent cinematic reenactment. Hardly anyone expected the new regime to last. The Bolsheviks promised the Russian people peace, bread and power to the Soviets. Peace turned out to mean abject capitulation. These are the ruins of the White Palace at Brest in Belarus, or Brest-Litovsk, as it was known at the time of the First World War, when it was a major Russian fortress. And it was here, in March 1918, that the German High Command demanded and secured the most astonishing concessions from a rather motley Bolshevik delegation that included a peasant named Roman Stashkov, who'd been picked up along the way to represent Russian agriculture. Well, the territories ceded by the Bolsheviks included a third of Russia's agricultural land, half its industry, and 90% of its coal mines. The war in the East was the war the Germans won. But the Germans were unable to consolidate these breathtaking gains. Ironically, the end of the war in the West meant the resumption of war in the East. In the Russian Empire after 1918, world war mutated into civil war. It was a war that was nearly as bloody as the conventional war before it. This, not the 1917 revolution, was what really shook the world. For a time, it seemed as if, like the influenza epidemic that was sweeping the world, Bolshevism was contagious. Soviet-style regimes sprang up all over Europe, in Munich, in Hamburg, in Budapest. The red flag even flew over the Glasgow city chambers. Euphorically, Lenin dreamt of a union of Soviet republics of Asia and Europe. Yet in Russia itself, the Bolsheviks' authority was non-existent outside the big cities. Against them were arrayed four counter-revolutionary, or white, armies, led by experienced Tsarist generals and supported by British, French, American and Japanese forces. It seemed more than likely that the Bolshevik regime would soon be overthrown. In August 1918, anti-Bolshevik forces had taken Kazan after a month of brutal fighting, and deserters from the Bolshevik Red Army were fleeing in confusion. Another step back along the Volga would open the road to Moscow. And then, Trotsky turned up. 
Trotsky was a journalist, not a general. Yet the goatee-bearded intellectual turned out to have a talent for ruthlessness, as well as for rhetoric. Bolshevism claimed to be about people power. It turned out to be nothing of the kind. When Trotsky arrived in Kazan, it was to terror, in the name of martial law, that he turned. Trotsky brought 27 deserters here to Sviashk and had them shot. He was convinced that the only way to stop his Red Army soldiers, most of whom were peasants, from running away or deserting was to station machine gun posts behind the lines and shoot anybody who didn't advance. It was a clear turning point in the history of the Russian Civil War. It was also an ominous sign of what the Bolsheviks would do once they'd won it. In the bitter fighting for this Volga bridge, Trotsky's terror tactics worked. The bridge was saved and Kazan retaken. Terror now became the foundation of Bolshevik rule. For Lenin too, the only way to ensure that peasants handed over their grain to feed the Red Army was to order exemplary executions of so-called kulaks the mythical capitalist peasants whom it suited the Bolsheviks to demonize. How can you make a revolution without firing squads, Lenin asked. On August the 11th, 1918, he told Bolshevik leaders in Penza precisely what he had in mind. Hang no fewer than a hundred well-known kulaks, rich bags and bloodsuckers. Do it so that for hundreds of kilometers around, the people might see, might tremble. At the heart of this new tyranny was the all-Russian Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, the Cheka for short. This building in St. Petersburg was its first headquarters. Under Felix Dzerzhinsky, and this is his desk right here, the Bolsheviks created an entirely new system of political policing, one which had absolutely no compunction about simply shooting people on suspicion. Here's a typical order Dzerzhinsky issued from September 1919, which lists no fewer than 67 people shot on suspicion of counter-revolutionary espionage. Number one on the list is a Liberal MP by the name of Nikolai Shepkin. The thing that really impresses me about this document is the extent to which these people were sent to their deaths on completely trumped-up charges. The Bolshevik press relished all this. The Sheka does not judge, it strikes. It does not pardon, it destroys all those caught on the other side of the barricades. Dzerzhinsky and his smiling, sadistic gangsters were the willing executioners for Lenin's doctrine of a merciless class war. From his offices here and in Moscow, Dzerzhinsky presided over the executions of around 300,000 people. Some of them took place just across the road in the park opposite his office. I wonder if he watched. But this was far more than just a war between classes. As the old Russian Empire fractured, there was also an explosion of ethnic conflict. The non-Russian nationalities within the Tsarist Empire at first had greeted the revolution as a springtime of the peoples. In the confusion of the civil war, Poles, Lithuanians, Ukrainians and others rose up against Russian rule. There seemed every likelihood that the old empire was simply going to fragment along ethnic lines into a hundred pieces. Marx had predicted a titanic struggle between proletariat and bourgeoisie, but there are hundreds of files here in the Russian state archives that make it clear the Russian Civil War was as much about ethnic conflict 
as it was about class conflict. At first, the Bolsheviks simply swam with the tide, proclaiming the right of all peoples to self-determination through to complete secession from Russia. But the man they put in charge of implementing this policy as People's Commissar for Nationalities Affairs, although himself a Georgian by birth, was a rather unlikely champion of minority rights. His name was Joseph Jugashvili, Stalin to his fellow revolutionaries. Stalin quickly realised that the nationalities question was spiralling out of control. Reports were coming in, like this one from Kyrgyzia, describing 500 to 600 Russian households being expelled from their homes out into the frost in just 24 hours by local Kyrgyz tribesmen. But Stalin soon revealed that he was more than a match for Lenin and Trotsky when it came to ruthlessness. Soon he was writing congratulating Estonian Bolsheviks on having set up what he called an excellent concentration camp. Indeed, Stalin knocked heads together so hard in his native Georgia that Lenin was moved to describe him as a greater Russian chauvinist. Between 1918 and 1922 in Russia, ethnic war collided with class war to produce a death toll approaching 8 million, only slightly less than the total losses for the First World War itself. For anyone living between Vilnius and Vladivostok, the years after the supposed end of the First World War brought anything but peace. And the outcome? In effect, one Russian empire had simply been replaced by another. Some cynics said the political system hadn't changed much either. After all, what was Lenin if not a red Tsar wielding absolute power over a subject people? But that was to overlook the vast difference in ethos that separated the old empire from the new. Of course, Russia had had terrible Tsars in its past, but the empire founded by Lenin was the first regime since the short-lived tyranny of the Jacobins in revolutionary France to be based on terror itself. In January 1919, the Western leaders gathered in Paris to make peace. The top man in the top hat was the American President Woodrow Wilson, who was convinced that the new post-imperial Europe should be made up of independent nation-states. But there was a difficulty Wilson hadn't foreseen. All over Europe, nation-building meant the creation of sizable ethnic minorities. But whereas multi-ethnic societies had been more or less viable within the old empires, in the new nation-states, self-determination turned out to mean the oppression of these minorities, or worse. The war hadn't been the war to end war, as Wilson had hoped. But this was certainly the peace to end peace. This is one of the last remaining Christian outposts in Turkey, a survival of the attempt to turn another multi-ethnic entity, the Ottoman Empire, into a nice, neat nation-state. Even before 1914, the Young Turks, a group of ambitious army officers, had seized power with the aim of modernising the Ottoman system. One tactic they adopted was the suppression of the empire's ethnic minorities. First in line were the Armenians, Orthodox Christians, who had long played a key entrepreneurial role in the Ottoman economy. 
Armenians who lived in the region of Kesaria were gathered together by Turkish soldiers to have their photo taken in front of a local jail. An hour later, they were all shot. In the next three years, anything up to one and a half million Armenian men, women and children died as an entire people were forcibly transported from Armenia and Anatolia to Syria, where they were simply driven into the desert to die of thirst and hunger. Outside Turkey, it's generally acknowledged to have been the first true genocide, the organized, state-sponsored killing of a people for the intended purpose of putting an end to their collective existence. Yet the attempted annihilation of the Armenian community was only the beginning of a wave of ethnic violence as the Ottoman Empire was ripped apart and then rebuilt as a nation state. There used to be more than two million Greeks living in Anatolia. They'd lived here for 3,000 years. In fact, they built the place. And yet, within just a few years of the end of the First World War, the Greeks of Anatolia would have to leave all this behind. What better symbol for the decline of the West than the brutal expulsion of Hellenic civilization from Asia Minor, except possibly the abject failure of the heirs of Athenian democracy to do anything to prevent it? It was the British government that encouraged Greek forces to occupy the Turkish port of Smyrna, now Izmir, on the Aegean Sea. At first it went the Greeks' way. They advanced deep into Anatolia. But in the crisis of wartime, the Turks had found a new and charismatic leader. Born in Salonika, the fair-haired, blue-eyed Mustafa Kemal who in 1915 had led the defense of Gallipoli against British invasion, now masterminded the expulsion of the Greeks. When Kemal struck in the summer of 1922, those who didn't surrender took to their heels. As they fled towards the Aegean, their ranks were swelled by tens of thousands of Greek civilians. The 500 or so inhabitants of Sazak, like the people of hundreds of other villages along this coast, packed up as much of their belongings as they could carry and set off in boats for Greece. In some places, recover from history, but not this one. Kind of reminds me of the highland clearances, except... There was an economic motive for that. This was just purely political. Hundreds of people kicked out of their homes for nothing. Thousands more ethnic Greeks made for Smyrna itself, hoping that its large Armenian and Greek Christian communities would afford them protection. In September 1922, Kemal's army occupied the town. They sealed off the Armenian quarter and began systematically butchering its 25,000 inhabitants. The American consul George Horton looked on in horror. They had the air of hunters crouching and stalking their prey. The hunting and killing of Armenian men, either by hacking or clubbing, or driving out in squads into the country and shooting caused an unimaginable panic. Then they set fire to the Armenian quarter to incinerate any survivors. Tens of thousands of Greek refugees were trapped in an area half a mile long and a hundred feet wide between the fire and the sea. Greeks reached the waterfront over there. 
they saw a flotilla of foreign ships lying in the harbour. More than 20 British, French and American warships. Thank God, they thought, were saved. And yet the Western forces did next to nothing to help them. Not for the last time in the 20th century, an international contingent looked on as ethnic cleansing was committed. Here was a scene straight out of Wells' War of the Worlds. Yet the perpetrators weren't Martians, but human beings, bent on treating their fellow men as aliens. To the appalled George Horton, who was desperately trying to buy Greeks and Armenians safe passage with his own money, this was an act of religious fanaticism. Yet in reality, it was more ethnic cleansing than holy war. As Horton noted bitterly, the problem of the minorities is here solved for all time. Kemal saw no need to massacre the Greeks in Smyrna. He simply gave the Greek government until October the 1st to evacuate them all. The Greeks retaliated in kind. By the end of 1923, nearly 1.3 million Anatolian Christians and up to 400,000 Balkan Muslims had been forced out of their ancestral homes. The Armenian genocide and the so-called population exchanges of Greek and Turkish minorities illustrated with a terrible clarity what could happen when empires were beaten into nations. It was as if, for the sake of a spuriously modern uniformity, the basest instincts of ordinary men were unleashed in a kind of tribal bloodletting. The 20th century had begun with the Western empires bestriding the globe. Yet their war to the death had ignited fires of racial animosity that could not easily be put out. If the transition from Ottoman Empire to Turkish nation-state could be achieved only with the help of genocide and mass expulsions, what was to prevent similar things happening in the patchwork quilt of new states that the peacemakers had made in Central Europe? As the German-Jewish physician Alfred Döblin succinctly put it, today's states are the graves of nations. The age of genocide had only just begun. <laughs> 